see what you mean. What? The no lines. Fuck lines on my teeth. I look amazing. This is how I look all the time. You meet me in person and I'm just, there's no texture to my skin. Marketing Nerds of the World. It's time for another episode of Hamya. And today, Margo and I want to talk about something that you might be seeing talked about uh, pretty actively in the online business space. You might see uh, ads for programs about it. You might be listening in on conversations and webinars about it. And this is the topic of launching with a small list. Basically, uh, finding ways to sell to your audience when you have a uh, below what might be industry average number of people on your mailing list. Is it possible to sell to them? How should you sell to them? What should you sell to them? We're going to dig into all that and more on this episode. But first, Margo, can you please define for the folks at home what a small list is? So the, the conventional answer is that list size is in the eye of the beholder. And I say that is false and I behold, I am beholder. No, we all know what that means. Like small list shame is kind of like under 2000, right? Or really yeah. under 5,000, but like under 2000 is kind of where a lot of people in our space are and nobody wants to talk about it. And then of course there's the people who are like, I only have 10,000 and everyone else has 100,000. And then like, it never ends. It's, it's like you're chasing the horizon. The first thing I wanna talk about in terms of like this, it's a common marketing tagline right now where it's like, you can launch even with a small list. And it's like, is that true? And the answer is of course, yes. Like you can technically launch to a list of 10 people. Like you can launch to a list of any size. What matters most is that, you know, people are engaged and they're actually buyers on your list. I mean, same rules apply, right? Like yeah. you're only ever talking to people. So there's nothing fundamentally different about a large or small list because you still need to make the case for why they should care. You still need to have talked to them for the several months prior before you make an offer. You still need to know who they are and what they care about. I would say that the biggest differentiator though is the math. <laughs> and what I, I guess what I mean, uh. <laughs> oh God, oh my God, the math. So you hear a lot of people that are like, you can make tons of money no matter what your list size is, which like in theory is true, but you also have to understand your market. So if you operate in a market where the type of thing that you offer is in the $2,000 range or the five or $10,000 range, you need to sell less of them than if you were selling something that was 49, 100, 200, $300. Mm -hmm. And so there comes a point where depending on what pricing strategies you go with and what the market can bear, that you do kind of have to play a numbers game. So for example, if you are in the $49 price range, you're probably going to need bigger numbers to hit the same profit goals as someone who is selling something for $5,000. Now, if you're nodding your head being like, yeah, no shit, Margo, I know that. You should know that, but a lot of people don't. A lot of people don't. A lot of people are like, I'm gonna, out of left field, just launch this because I believe I'm worth it. And they should be paying me two to $5,000 for this thing because it's really high quality. And sometimes it has nothing to do with quality, just the market is not there yet. And so yeah. you might have a market, we were talking before this call, we have a few friends that, had to discover like even though they made two thousand dollar products the sweet spot for their market was in the hundred fifty dollar range i have a friend it was seven ninety nine seven dollars and ninety nine cents so mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if her list was two thousand people she's not gonna be profitable until that list got really 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 big and yeah. it did but it's just a different strategy so depending on like what your products and services are that's where the list size matters yeah, absolutely. And I think there's, I would also like to help everybody eradicate their sense of list shame for a moment, yeah. because I think it's so important to know that um, even if your list is small, if you are in conversation with your audience, they are engaged and they're obsessed with what you do. There's the saying that's like, you could make a million dollars off a 200 person list if everybody's obsessed with what you're doing. And I was trying to think about moments in which that would be like accurate. It's like a very encouraging stat. And it's technically true because yeah. it's less about the sheer numbers. You know, you can have 10,000 people on your list who don't give a fuck, or you have 200 people who are obsessed with you and will buy everything you're selling, but the odds of that happening are slim. Zero. Um, so, well, I mean, the point zero, zero, one. But I think it's so important to keep in mind that it's less about 
the sheer scale of numbers and more like, as you said, about understanding what your market wants, what kind of investment they can bear, and what conversations you're having that's going to make them excited to invest in. And what's been so interesting, too, is that this is where people are also running into problems with Facebook ads. Because mm. when it comes to lead gen around the launch, it is really, really rare that somebody's going to come in through a Facebook ad and immediately hand you ten thousand dollars. Yep, that's just you're playing shitty odds. The original model of the launch model traditionally, well, for traditionally in the internet CLF. internet world, which is CLF, um, and that's been around what, like seven years now, five? Really? I don't know. Oh. How, how many years? God, no, I don't know. When a minute. Walker publish his book. I don't know. Someone Google that for us. Yeah. Internet years count like dog years. So technically, CLF is now 49 years old. So no wonder it's not working as well as it works. Because consumers are, first of all, accustomed to the model. They know if you have a webinar, there's going to be an offer at the end of it. It's, it might be high ticket. And they also know that they're going to be sent through this funnel. And I find that usually it is getting harder and harder to warm people up to buy from you in that tiny time frame, especially when it's high ticket which is why everybody who I know who's feeding with high ticket offers right now is not just doing it through PLF and hands off. They're doing personal follow-ups. And we've talked about this before, yeah. um, but this is, you can launch to a list of any size if you are willing to hustle really fucking hard. And the PLF model is for people who basically like play the numbers game. You bring in 300, 600, 3000 additional people via the ads, and then you play the odds. Okay. So I'm going to convert one to 2% of the room at this price point. You're going to need to do these sales calls hypothetically. And that was a great model for, you know, running sales without necessarily needing to do all the follow-up. But now people want that connection. And that, again, is great for small list size havers because it means it doesn't really fucking matter anymore uh, whether or not you have 10,000 people on your list. What matters is you know the people who are going to buy from you and you know to talk to them, pursue them, and get the offer in front of them. But it's a lot more complicated and labor-intensive. Well, launching is pretty labor-intensive. Than the hypothetical of running an evergreen funnel to a two thousand dollar program. Yeah, well, I have problems with evergreen funnel models. <laughs> <laughs> the, no, I think you're right. The one thing I will caveat is I I do think that it does matter. Like I think it just depends mm -hmm. on your business. Like there are certain businesses where focusing on lead gen for a little bit, yeah, actually would be better than immediately launching. Um, oh, yeah, I was talking about in terms of like the launch model itself. Oh, not, okay. yeah, 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 just like how launches worked previously, not the. Not yeah, lead yeah, gen yeah. is lead, trash in general. Lead gen Fuck as lead gen. Of your launch. Is Anarchy. Yeah. Fuck lead gen. Anyway, <laughs> that's not the hill I'm going to die on too. It made me think of the question I get asked a lot, but nobody says it quite in this way, but this is what they mean, which is, should you have a list? And do you even need one? And uh, I, I wrote a piece for Inc. It was actually my first piece for them that said how I built my business without a website that got was really, really yeah. popular. That's probably one of the most common questions I get asked all the time. Like, do I really need a website? And to your point, like in the beginning, you need to hustle for sales. So mm -hmm. if a website is going to help you do that, then yes. I think a lot of people feel like they need a website for the same reason you feel like you need a business card and you need an, you know, there's so yeah. certain things that like aren't really relevant to your bottom line, but there comes a point where if you're going to be running an online business, then yes, a list matters, but not everyone's running an online business. So that's the other thing that I think gets confused is that we, we have that mantra that like lead gen specifically in the sense of getting traffic to your site to convert into opt-ins on your email list it's like the gold standard because it's the one thing no one can take away from you and everybody makes the case for email which i agree with i'm an email marketer like don't like i'm not gonna sit there and tell you that's wrong but <laughs> i do actually i am gonna sit here and tell you that's wrong and i'll tell you why because some companies aren't reliant on cold traffic some mm. people are in relationship businesses some people yeah. are in referral businesses I had a student who had an audio and visual company. So they installed home theaters basically and like audio systems. Nobody was Googling this. They were having complete word of mouth referrals. So when they were launching something new, it wasn't really relevant. Like their email list was people who'd worked with them in the past um, mm -hmm. or that might've been interested, but it was pretty much all warm traffic that was coming to see them. And they were mostly scoping them out to see if they were legit. And I think in that case, like you don't need to be so reliant on your list because your list is actually your in-person Rolodex. Mm. Like, That's kind of where it, where it started from. Like it was, yeah. it was you mailed stuff too. That's where lists started. I like this distinction between uh, people who need cold traffic in order to move, uh, make the numbers and people who are in relationship businesses already. Yeah. And I think as service providers, that's actually a, a larger chunk of people than, than we realize, which is why people are like, 
you get launched to a small list because they already have that relationship with their audience because they've already been serving and showing up. Um, they got the opt-in and all of that stuff. This is why I love that you pointed out, Margot, that some businesses, you know, it, there's so much that goes into what, how, what kind of list you need, how big does it have to be? And that's more than just like vanity metrics. That's more than like, what's it going to make me proud to say? Like how many people are on your email list? It has to do with, again, like the, uh, the stuff, kind of stuff you sell. So like if it's a seven ninety nine offer, you've got to play that numbers game. You've got to run ads, bring those leads in. And they're also much more likely to buy because it's a low ticket offer. And there's not as much um, of like the mental work or trust building necessary to have someone spend seven ninety nine a month, for example. And two, I think it is basically like the traditional maybe lead gen play the numbers model is not appropriate anymore for high ticket sales for like say 2K or above. Um, in the sense that you need those relationships and people who have just met you out of the blue are not very likely to invest in you at that level. Basically what this comes down to is uh, if you have a small list, you're Louis Vuitton. If you're focusing on the cold traffic, you're McDonald's. No, I'm not saying that, but I think people should be comforted in the fact that if they have a small list, if, as long as they're in relationship with that list, of course they could turn it into uh, a profitable launch. Of course they can but it's going to take legwork. It's going to take really honest and direct approaches. And you can't be shy about sales when you're selling to a small list, period. You cannot hide I think that's, that's the important point is that like, yeah. I think people don't realize that the principles are the same, small or mm -hmm. big, but the profit is going to be different. And yeah. so that's the part that I want people to pay attention to. I've, I've gotten a lot of this, this conversation originated because there are people early in my career who would be like, small list, you absolutely can sell to them. And I'd be like, but there's an upper limit mm, to yes. what you can sell. Like you can't always hit them up with a new offer um, because you're going to punch the well dry and are like, that's a scarcity mentality. And I'm like, that's not scarcity. Like I just hit them up. They said, no, you need to yeah. just recover. It's like, I don't need new jeggings from Gap if I just bought jeggings from Gap. It is easier to launch something constantly to a bigger list because more people will see it. It's not going to impact your numbers as hard having the unsubs. Like every time I launch, I watch those unsub numbers go down and I'm just like, <laughs> fuck. But at the same time, it's fine. Like these people were not going to buy from me. They can go. But when you have a smaller list and you, the, the pool is smaller, it's easier to exhaust. So you have to be mindful of the cadence for sure. And that's another reason to focus on when you do sell selling high ticket offers to your small list because that's going to be, or like, you know, or stuff that's going to no, be worthwhile. To, if it's the right market. Like, yeah, if it's the right market, stuff that's going to be worthwhile uh, in order to make you money, basically. Because if you're selling a $100 program and, you know, 10 people buy it, you made a thousand bucks, great. But is that going to reflect the amount of effort it took to exactly. create the sequence and the promo and all this stuff? So that's exactly, so I, I'd like to end on this question of like, what is your list for? That's the question I really want us to ask ourselves because it's become marketing Bible, at least in the digital space. You have to have an email list. And I am in the evangelism camp for that. Um, for sure. I would hope so. But no, because I also, I, I do believe that that is really important for digital marketing, but what kind of business do you run? I think that's the more important question. Like, what are you trying to do? So like for me, I view my list as future book buyers. People are like, why haven't you sold a course? And I'm like, because the numbers don't make sense for me yet. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Like I could do a, a nice month or two of sales. And then after that, it's like, then I have to focus really hard on lead gen. And I don't want that. I want to build this relationship with them over time. So when I sell a book, they're there and they're interested and I can workshop ideas with them mm -hmm. in, in conjunction. So they, they we're always in conversation and they're helping me yeah. build my ideas. And so that's a fundamentally different approach than people who see a list as like a distribution channel for content or mm -hmm. a distribution channel for sales. There's lots of different ways. And the moral for me is, or and like what I try and teach is it shouldn't be transactional regardless of what it is. So know what it's for, but remember there's still people on the other side. Like there is no one size fits all. You can't be delusional about like, okay, I have a small list, but I could be a bajillionaire now. Like you, you have to see what the market will bear. And the same is true for big lists actually. Like there's different problems on that side. Yeah. You can have a big list and not have people buy from you. That's the thing. So this was interesting. Jason's book has this great story. And I think I might've told this before on Ham Yacht where he basically like shut down a $25,000 person email list. It was like, this is in true Jason's book style. There was this big article about it that he wrote in tandem. And he basically explains that he had built that list 
by offering, by saying basically like someone on this email list is going to win a free iPad. And so people signed up and the list grew and it was like, yay. But then when it came to make an offer, really kind of launched to crickets and it was much harder to sell despite the numbers because why? People weren't on his list because they were interested in learning from Jason Cook. People were on his list because they were interested in getting a free iPad, winning a free iPad. So I think that's such an important distinction too. And I'm totally with you, Margo, in that my email list is about relationship building is the common wisdom is your email list is the only platform that you really own. Uh, if Facebook goes down tomorrow, Instagram, Twitter, uh, we are all shit out of luck and email list will sort of protect you, but that doesn't tell me what's going to happen if convert kit goes down, but we're not going to think about that today. And I think it's so important to establish that relationship and serve, but also remember, I think when people, it's really easy to fall into the trap of thinking like I'm relationship building. So I should not be selling to my list period. Like I should just be offering value. Yeah. And this is, I saw a tweet that just like made my skin crawl the other week, which is basically someone responding to a tweet about like, how likely are you to buy from somebody like on their email list, basically? And one person was like, not me, never. I just hate being sold to. There's like, this, the, the goal is to serve, serve, serve. And then you sell through serving. That's the long game that most people just don't want to play. And I was like, are you like, have you ever tried to sell anything like by just creating content? It doesn't work. Like, of course you have to use sales tactics. You have to use the strategy. You have to shift the conversation if you're going to sell and but at the same time like it can still be a useful valuable conversation we did a whole episode on this called fresh to perform so you can go watch that one but i think it's so important to remember that in cultivating a relationship with your list and being of service you are allowed even if your list is small to sell like you are allowed to even if you are in that relationship building space even if you want to be of service without demanding money you are able to do both and it can feel a little more awkward and confronting with a smaller list, but it is just as important and just as possible for you to have a great payday with a smaller list, as long as, again, you have that relationship, you have that trust built, and you know sort of that you have created something people need at a price point that the market's going to respond to. You're going to be okay. All right, to stop. Totally. I love this. And you can also practice by selling ideas in yeah. little ways, like practice having strong CTAs. So mm -hmm. maybe you're not selling something for cash, but you can be decisive and be clear and direct when you say, I want you to click here or mm -hmm. read this, do this, reply to me. Like there are yeah. instructional things that you can do to like build up your muscle for when you have an ask. And this is, listen, we can love and hate on Gary Vee, but this is one thing I really do think he got right, which is his, his jab, 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 right hook framework, which is simply like when you give, give generously. But when mm -hmm. you have an ask, ask. Yeah, like, oh, exactly. Ask. Like be like, I want you to buy my book. I want you to buy this course. This yeah. is or like, obviously you should frame it as to why they should. But the point is you've gotten all this free content and the truth is people are going to want to. Like it never yeah. is annoying. The second yeah. someone you like and have been following turns around and is like, hey, by the way, if you like what you've had up to this point, I made something else. Would Make you up. like it? You got to pay for it, but. Yeah. And there are so many different ways to create different levels of value. Like, I think you can offer things like, you know, smaller things like 60 minute sessions. I know that you can offer even like free 10 minute conversations. I know somebody in this room was doing that to gain some insight from their email list, which is the lovely Margo over here, and which I will totally be copying soon. So everyone sit tight. But it becomes so much more personal when your list is smaller. It feels more personal. It feels closer. But at the same time, the rules still apply. Like this is business and it's okay to make the ask. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that point. So we'll, uh, I will share a little bit about that. Like the fun things that you can do with a smaller list. Yeah. You can reply to all your emails. <laughs> I always tell my readers, like, I'm so excited for when I won't be able to respond to this. I love reading reader emails. I wish I got to be better on uh, keeping on top of my replies for sure. That's I know. Fun. One day I would be like, I am so busy and important that like, I saw it, but I really couldn't even say thanks. It's coming, you guys. It's coming. But no, there's, there's a lot of ways that you can experiment. Like you could do content that's more experimental and see how it lands. Mm -hmm. And there's less consequences because you're unsubscribed, even though they might hurt you. It might just be six people instead yep. of 700 or 2000 every time you send, because it's always going to be the same proportionally. <laughs> so yeah. it just depends on the number of your list. Yeah. Um, you can make small asks, you can respond, you can be in conversation with them. I think you should be doing that regardless as the yeah, yeah. list size grows, but it's much easier when it's smaller to get a picture of like who these people are, what they want and, yeah. and play. 
and the, also we can't forget the reason behind having a small list too is that people are finding you organically. People aren't clicking it out and saying, who is this? I think I need this. They are hearing about you. They are signing up for your opt-in. They are following their way to your email list from your articles or your content or just listening to a conference or something like that. So yeah. those people are precious. Those people are basically like those that have a high potential for engagement more than ice cold beats coming in through a Facebook ad. So count your blessings there. I think that's what I love about my list. The people who are there really want to be there. Um, and they know who I am and they're familiar with my work already. And it's just really fun to hang out with them and share with them and hear from them. So there are many, many blessings to having a modest sized list. Yeah. Celebrate them. <laughs> well, I think there's a lot here that we have to chew on in terms of what it means to launch to a small list. And we'd love to hear your thoughts on this topic in the comments below. So tell us. Have you felt small list shame? How have your launches gone? Prove us wrong. Give us your numbers. Tell us all the things. We would love to continue this conversation. So talk to us in the comments below. If you are new to Hamya, subscribe, hit the like button. If you liked it, come join us. We're here every two weeks and tell all of your friends. I am Margo Aaron. And I'm Hillary Wise. We will see you in two weeks. Bye. Bye guys.